Music for Global Change. Creating music that inspires the world. Welcome to the Music for Global Change broadcast. And now here's your host, founder and music ambassador Skylar Jett with Deborah Fenella and Tom Bryant. Are you ready? Are you ready? Are you ready? To start a revolution? Are you ready? Are you ready? Are you ready? To start a revolution? Greetings, namaste. Welcome to the Music for Global Change broadcast. Hello, I'm Deborah Fenella here with music ambassador and founder of Music for Global Change, Skylar Jett and presenter Tom Bryant. Hello. Hello. Now, we're really excited and blessed to have on our show the wonderful, talented singer, Antonia Bennett, daughter of the legendary singer, Antonio Bennett. Good evening. How are you? I'm doing good. How are you? I'm fine, thank you. You've been singing from a very early age, like myself, and singing with your father as well. And you've actually been opening his shows for the past 10 years. So um, please tell us a little bit about your amazing path and embarking down that path of singing, please. Sure. Well, I mean... It really started even much younger than that. I just always kind of sat in in his shows. And then um, I went to music school and I went to Berklee College of Music in Boston. For And after that, I just started, started doing a lot of my own shows and whatnot. And it just was a nat- very natural progression. And then he, he uh, went from having me just do a couple of songs opening up the show for him and um and I've spent a, a great deal of time you know and it, it's been such a blessing to be able to in my older years to be able to spend so much time with him you've also um, been in parking down the path of songwriting as well haven't you so um please tell us your very first song that you wrote and what it was about wow I guess the first one song I wrote was actually about my mother when I was quite young um and I don't even think I have a recording of it but uh I might somewhere I don't know where it would be yeah Oh, that's wonderful. So your mum was obviously your inspiration as well as your dad. And you wrote a song all about how inspired you are by your beautiful mum too. Artists we take from things all around us, you know, we take uh, from from everything. Yeah. Yes. So uh, have you got any plans to write one about your dad <laughs> in the future? Well, I- I, I'm not opposed to it. I have no big plans, but uh, you know, uh, there have been a lot of things that I've written that have that have echoed uh, memories or experiences from him, and you know, maybe more openly at some point, I'll write a song about him. Oh, that'd be wonderful. If you were growing up, you know, with the likes of Frank Sinatra, Dean Martin, and Gene Kelly as well. Who was your inspiration as a child? I mean, history? I think my inspiration was. Again, all of these different people, I was also surrounded by a lot of great writers. You know, one of the people that came to the house a lot was Swifty Lazar, who was like one of the most famous agents for, for literary writers. And um, and I think that, you know, when you're surrounded by so many different creative people, they all become your inspiration. Ella Fitzgerald was a big inspiration to me. And Rosie Clooney um, was somebody that I really looked up to, Rosemary Clooney. And I knew her, you know, my dad used to tour with her. And so I spent a good deal of time with her and her husband, Dante. You know, I think you just, after so much time being around, being around all those musicians, Count Basie and his band, you know, I used to go as a kid and in the summer with my dad and his band would be playing with my dad and and I would run through the backstage, like through the rooms and listen to all the guys warm up and things like that. And, Mm -hmm. you know, that really kind of leaves a mark on you. Mm -hmm. You introduced me to your dad at the Sonoma Jazz Festival. Yeah. Wow. You know what I love about your dad so much? He does this thing where when he, when he ends a song, he goes, 
And the band knows that, right? And <laughs> I mean, he got a standing ovation every song. I, I was loving that, you know? And I think he, he had turned 80 then. What was the most beautiful thing to me? Because musicians go, no, man, I'm too old. And I'm going, you can't say that to me because I, I met Antonia's dad. And he was still on the stage at 80. Well, I mean, he's 95 now. Yeah. Wow. So. Yeah, the other thing I love is your, your dad has a passion for art. He sure does. Yeah. He loves to paint. Is that like a release for him to be painting? I, I don't see it like that. I don't know. Maybe it is for him. A release in the same way that singing is, though, in a, in a different maybe manifestation of the same kind of creative energy. But yeah, I think for, you know, he always did that. He thought he was going to be a professional painter. He went to the school for industrial design as oh, wow. in high school, where he went to school. He was always painting as long as I've known him, he's been painting, but he was painting since, you know, since then he's been painting. He's and out on the road, he would always bring watercolors with him. If we went out to dinner, he always had a sketchbook. He just never stopped. That was just one of the things that he did that was part of his daily life, you know. I mean, he was a very young, older man for a long time. You know, yeah. he would go play tennis or go to the gym, go play tennis or vice versa. Come back, have breakfast, usually go to a museum in whatever city we were in. And wow. this was for sound check, you know, come back. And then he would usually have lunch or draw, you know, in one or the other order, you know, and then from there we would do sound check and he'd come back, do his scales, you know, get ready for the show or he get, you know. Scales? He did scales? Every day. Wow. Every day. Mm -hmm. That's why his voice is so strong. And like, most of the time he played with a trio, right? Trio or quartet. I mean, he did as go on the road with those big bands and stuff, but usually not for uh, a, like an extended period of time in his in the years that I grew up with him. I mean, we would go out in the summer with the Basie band or something like that, or do a certain amount of dates. But then the rest of the time, it would be a trio or a quartet. Our concept is to do social conscious music, so we're trying to start this genre of social conscious music, which it hasn't done be, been done before, but there's been millions of songs. As a matter of fact, when I looked on Google, there's been 192 million uh, social conscious songs written. So there's never, but there's never been a platform for it or radio stations or, or uh, performance uh, places, right? And that's what we're, we're trying to start with. Well, that's what we're gonna do with music global, global change. I love to hear your thoughts about who were some of your best artists that wrote social conscious songs that stuck with you. I mean, I think the first person that comes to mind is John Lennon. You know, yes. because you know, I mean, imagine, I think, imagine, yeah, that's like one of the first things. And I think a lot of people write those types of songs. They don't set out to do that. You know, it's just, you know, life is so big. And, and when you're writing music, you tend to write about what's happening to you or what's around you, or you write about love songs, things like that. But once you've written your, I don't know, 20th love song or whatnot, you start to yeah. write about all kinds of things, all, all different kinds of life experiences. And I think people do tend to, after a while, to start to write about different subjects that are things that we all go through, that we all think about. Yeah. Do you remember Marvin Gaye? Sure. And he had the What's Going On album, What's right? What's Going On, great record. That, that was, and then um, Nina Simone and Curtis Mayfield and... You know, there's just so many. You know what, what was crazy? Because all of them started out doing love songs. But when they started doing social conscious songs, their career went through the roof. Because, sure. Because cause social conscious music isn't for somebody. It's for everybody. It's for everybody. And even people who've never really been in love, you yeah. know, yeah, yeah. yeah. or whatever, you know, even young people, that, that can they can relate to that, you know, to those types of experiences. You know, have you ever written social conscious a song? I've never set out to do it. I guess there would definitely be some of my songs that have like bits and pieces that are a little bit broader in that way. Yeah, but but maybe not the whole song. 
You okay. Know? What we want to do is that all the guests that we get on, we try to get them to do a, a social conscious song so that when we go to show that this could be a, a big thing, any, any lyrics that heal, educate, and solve problems, right? It could be any any kind of instrumentation whatsoever. I look at, you know, Michael Jackson and YouTube. When, when they started doing uh, social conscious music, their careers went through the roof, you know? Sure. I'd I, I love for you to write one and, and have it a part of, so we can show people that, you know, famous people write, write these songs because they feel that they can change, make social change in the world through a song that could help all of us. You know, we, we all need it. I mean, I've never been, I've been to 36 countries. None, every one of them had music. Absolutely. Right? It's the universal language. Yeah. You've done so many concerts. I mean, what's one of the places where you, you know, they speak in a whole nother language, but they just, they just fell in love with your dad or they fell in love with you to open it for your dad. And what's, what's one of the countries that you just, wow, this is so cool. I mean, honestly, there've been so many great experiences and places. Um, I did a show not with my dad in Dubai and really at the jazz festival in Dubai and had a really um, wonderful experience. And also, you know, pretty much I've been very blessed in that way that most of the places that I've played have been extraordinary experiences and beautiful concert halls. And it's been such a blessing. I would say you know, Italy is always so nice to play, you know, the people are so warm. And it's a little bit trippy because the way that they are as an audience is different than, you know, here, you know, after you're done singing a song or a solo or whatever, they clap right away or whatnot. There, they're really quiet. And then at the end, they run <laughs> to the stage, you know, they just like run up to the stage. Wow. And so, it's a little bit different because when you're doing it, you're like, am I, you know, am I, is this communication <laughs> getting yeah. through? But yeah. they realize, no, they really loved it. There's so many different cultures and, and beautiful places. Mm -hmm. Who yeah, are uh, the uh, places that you've performed? Which is, you, has been the sort of favoritist out of all of them? Gosh, I, you know, that's very hard to say. I think and I would say that probably this is a similar experience for a lot of musicians. You know, I think that my favorite places to play are the places where I made a connection with somebody, a person, an old friend, a new friend. You know, you go to so many different places and then those are the places that you really kind of remember and want to go back to. Yeah. That makes any, wouldn't you say that that's kind of happens to a lot of musicians? When I replaced Lionel in the, in the Commodores and we went to go play in China, when I got to sing in the song Three Times a Lady, they, they took their lighters and they was going, you got 18,000 people with their lighters going from side to side, right? And they were all singing with me, right? Aww. But but then backstage I tried to talk to him and we could. <laughs> it's, not okay. it's like the only uh, you know English that they knew, right? Language of song, yeah. <laughs> and, and it goes to show you how powerful that might be. The only you yeah. know English in a lot of places, but I'm like you. You you go to Italy, you go to different countries, and it, music it connects us all so so beautifully, you know. It does. And, and we have to spread it even more. But, you know, since the pandemic, you know, we haven't been able to go out and perform. And I dedicated a song that I wrote for dancers because, you know, they, they haven't been able to go out neither and do their thing. Right. It's, yeah. Called Dance Like I'm Losing My Mind. And, and what I did was with, with this young guy that I helped produce, I saw Ter Terrell was on Oprah Winfrey show. Right. And Oprah Winfrey wanted to show him that all these people were dancing to his song Happy. So, and it was different countries and people would just have their cell phones and they out in the street and they dancing happy. And he just started crying because, you know, how beautiful is that? People around the world singing your song, right? And I got that idea from that Oprah Winfrey show. I got dancers from different countries. They dancing, you know, Africa, and they were, you know, and it's it just... It, music is the, like the most incredible feeling ever, you know. And you went to Berkeley, huh? I did, yeah. My buddy's a professor up in Berkeley. Nice. And he sings with Bobby McFerrin. He's a he's the bass singer for Bobby McFerrin. That's uh, great. Tom, you got a question? 
I do, yeah. I um, just want to talk a little bit about your music, Antonia. Your latest release, Embraceable You. Can you tell me a little bit about that song? What's what's the inspiration behind it? What was what was the kind of motive behind it? Well, I've always been a really big fan of Cole Porter. I mean, that most of the songs on that record, well, all of the songs on that record are standards or American songbook. And that wonderful composer, uh, British composer that wrote Sail Away. And he wrote all those great plays. It's Noel Coward. He's a wonderful British composer. He wrote a lovely song that I recorded a long time ago called Sail Away. And I was just thinking, because there's a lot of his songs that I, whenever I do American songbook type of uh, records or things like that, I always include him because he he wrote Mad About the Boy, which is also an incredible song. And But um, on that record, there are no Noel Coward tunes. But Cole Porter really could do it all. And he, like, he wrote great lyrics. Back in those days, you had lyricists. Most guys were or a top line writer, a lyricist, or they wrote the music, you know. And he wrote the most incredible love songs that just translated, that they've been translating through all these years. Thank you. Thank you. Also, Antonio, what does social conscious music actually mean to you? That's a good question. I, you know, I tend not to even think about it like that. I just think about, you know, what it is that I personally connect to. And, you know, one of the things that I think is so important is that we uplift one another and uh, make people feel good. And so sometimes it's not as blunt as a lyric, you know, in some like imagine that's very clearly a social consciousness type of song it causes for pause and and thought but there's a lot of music that's just there to make you feel good and I think that in especially times that we're living in that that's so important to be able to just feel good and uplifted and I I don't know if wholesome is the right word but that might be a a good (laughs) my my plan was to throw concerts around musicians that write songs that can heal the world, right? Oh. And, and just have incredible musicians that, that cause you know, like you said, uh, you know, somebody might write 20 love songs and then they'll write a song that they feel can change the world. Yes. And, but because there's no platform to keep that going, you know what I mean? And they go back to the love song thing and you're talking about yourself again, right? And, but you know, I would even go so far to say is the love song can change the world too because you know if i'm depressed or whatnot i the, there's one record that i always go back to listen to and it's an old record it's that's the louis armstrong and ella fitzgerald duets record and there's something about and it's all love songs you know on that record yeah. but the timber of the voice the sound the feel good type of energy it automatically makes me feel better Mm. it automatically makes me like you know feel good and i think that if people are feeling good they're less likely (laughs) to do things that are not so great you know that's that's right Uh, true true. what what kind of scales would your dad do well he studied bel canto uh, classical music bel canto he used to study with this guy carlo minotti and i guess he met him at the actor's studio before it was the actor's studio like at the very beginning stages of the actor's studio and he just he would just go and and do scales with him you know I mean my dad kind of came up from the story goes that he was like the black crow in the in the catholic choir they kicked him out of the choir for having a raspy voice as a kid yeah, his brother was, he. they called him like the young Caruso. His brother had this like very clear sound when they were children and he was singing at the Met and whatnot. And they considered my dad the Black Crow. So he just thought he was going to be a painter. <laughs> wow. he was, yeah, he thought. Yeah. But then, you know, through the years, he just kept doing it. And then when he was in the army, he became the librarian of the big band. And then after he got out of the army, he went for a record deal and got one. So, wow. You never know where life is going to take you. I wrote a song called Music Can Save the World. And my dream is to do it like a We Are the World kind of vibe, where I'm going to have different artists sing like one or two lines. Mm -hmm. And I'd like to invite you to sing on this song with the other artists. Because I want to get artists from different countries. and But then I want to have a big choir sing the hooks with you guys. 
And I want to get a, a little, little kids singing on it too in the choir, right? The trippy thing is uh, Elvis Presley's daughter wants to make it the theme song for her foundation, for, for, oh, the, for the Pres Presley Foundation, right? Which is really, really cool, you know? This is a song that could be really cool because like I said, I want to get singers from Portugal and different places and, and then take the money from it, start this little thing because uh, uh, Deborah and I and Tom, we're, we're going to try to get shoes to everyone that doesn't have shoes. So when they right when, when they come out when they come out to a concert, bring a pair of shoes that you ain't wearing, and we give you ten dollars off the off the price, right? Yes. And we're going to send it to we're going to send it to different countries where they don't have shoes. It's it's so much we can do with music that doesn't take a lot of money to do it, right? And we can help Absolutely. we can help people out. You know what I mean? And and uh, I tell people every, we're going to try to go go around to the Rotary clubs and. And ask, you know, the seniors, you know, that if some if your husband or your wife died and they were musicians, can you give us the inf instrument? And we're going to give it to single parents that that has a talented kid but can't can't afford the instrument. Because, but my thing is is you can't beat the sound of a human being. There you come. But so so we have to get these kids, you know, more involved in playing instruments. So I, I want. <laughs> I want young people to start playing real instruments, and 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 I, I, I love to tell them a story about your dad. He he does scales every day. They they don't think they have to scales, you know, have nothing. You know, still so. doing scales even now, and he's not, you know, he's got his piano player coming over three or four times a week, and he'll never stop doing. I mean, hey, hey, <laughs> we have England, L.A., and Maui Ow. on the call. <laughs> This is the coolest thing, right? Got to love technology. You got to love it. Hey, I can hear you. How you doing? Fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> meet, meet Antonia Bennett. Aloha. Antonia I'm, Bennett. I, I just, uh, I'm just admiring your setup because I'm so low technology today. <laughs> my yeah. computer wouldn't get on the internet. I'm like doing this from my phone and you are all set up. I'm so impressed. Eric Gilliam, you're an award-winning musician and entertainer. You're multi-talented. From the roots in Hawaii, you've performed live on stage, on stages of Broadway, the Grammy Awards. You've gone into the mainstream through various concerts and appearances in films and TV. You're currently the lead singer of Mick Fleetwood's Island Rumours Band, and you're based on the island of Maui, as we mentioned just a moment ago. That is all correct Lots yes talented Eric, definitely you? You're yes a you, no, you, and a musician you've also won the hoku award a hawaiian grammy for the best album with your partner willie k as yeah. the barefoot natives and also you, your versatility allows you to sing everything from rock pop r&b and hawaiian and you've also played with earth wind and fire Stephen tyler john legend willie nelson jamie fox and also michael mcdonald just to name a few and you've also graduated at the goodman school of drama in chicago as an actor singer and a performer please tell us have you always been sort of drawn to the music entertainment and the world of arts as a child growing up well, first of all, thank you for having me. Um, and yes, I am the most um, famous person you've never heard of. <laughs> I grew up in an entertainment family. My Hawaiian grandmother was a pretty famous entertainer in the 40s and the 50s. Um, she was from Hawaii. She became a very famous hula dancer and she ended up in Los Angeles on a ton of TV shows. Um, she worked with the Marx Brothers. She worked with the Rat, with the Rat Pack with Dean Martin and, and uh, Frank Sinatra and Sammy Davis Jr. And she had her own showroom in Las Vegas. Vegas at the Tropicana Hotel. So I grew up in that environment around her and my dad was, you know, wasn't really an entertainer. He was more like her gopher, but you know, he, he had a, a, t a taste for entertaining as well. And so we just grew up in an environment like, you know, that just always had music and, and dance and, and things happening. And then my dad met my mom and moved 
uh, told my mom and dad were 17 and 18 years old when they met in California. My dad was from Hawaii. My mom was from Wisconsin. And my dad said, I'm taking you to a tropical island. And my mom was like, well, I don't even know what that is. But <laughs> he brought her to Maui and started having kids here. And so we grew up here in, in the tropics. And eventually my grandmother, my Hawaiian grandmother, the entertainer grandmother moved to Maui as well. She retired from 60, 70 years in show business and she moved here. And and so we just grew up around this, you know, this world. And then the, the Hawaiian culture is very musical and there's always yeah. singing happening. Yeah. The, the, in most of Polynesia is like that. And so um, one thing led to another and I just ended up in high school and, and I was, you know, I knew I wanted to do music and stuff, but I was, you know, a little shy. I didn't really sure what was going on. And then I heard music coming from a room and I went, oh, what's going on over there? And once I walked through that door um, into the music and theater world in high school, I never looked back. I never, yeah. I, I never went to a football game. I never went to nothing. <laughs> it was just music and theater. And then that led me, that led me to Chicago to go to a performing arts school in Chicago at the Goodman School of Drama. And then from there, I just took off and ended up in New York working on Broadway and ended up in yeah. LA doing a ton of film and TV and just I don't know just it just became this this uh this thing that just rolled on by and here we are many years later and I'm I'm back in Hawaii doing you're doing, a, you're doing a movie with Jeff Bridges right now right yeah, I just I did a movie uh actually right at the beginning of the pandemic. <laughs> it worked out really good. I say best pandemic ever. <laughs> I, <was> like, <laughs> I got this project. I got a call from a director in um, Seattle who was great documentary filmmaker named Susan Cusera and she's made a, a bunch of very well-known documentaries and she was doing this movie called Hot Money and it's about climate change. You would love yeah. this. You guys would love oh, it. Wow. Okay. And okay. so she asked me to score the movie and I said uh, okay so i did it's on amazon prime it's called hot money okay and um it's a great film it's a heady film it really goes in depth about about climate change and she talks to some of the greatest minds and scientists around the planet and you get a real snapshot of, of what's going on with that and so jeff bridges was on that movie with her he is very much into you know taking care of our planet as well and so now that's parlayed into her next project which is going to be a, a movie about the hawaiian cowboys and jeff bridges is uh producing and i'm going to be doing the score for that as well so i actually did a movie before that with jeff bridges and i got a call i think i can say this i got a call from the director and she said hey um you know jeff bridges is on this movie and i'm wondering if i could hire you to record all of his dialogue and i was like oh okay cool all right because that's how he learns his dialogue for every movie he's ever done. Somebody records it and he listens to it and that's how he memorizes his dialogue. And oh, I was like, wow. oh, okay, that's cool. So I recorded all of his dialogue. I mean, there's a lot of dialogue for this movie. Yeah. And then all of a sudden he calls me and he's like, hey, Eric, how's it going, man? It's Jeff Bridges. Hey, I dig your reading <laughs> of my stuff, buddy. Hey, listen, you know, on this, uh, can we go through a few things, you know, like on this, uh, this, this line right here, can you read it a little bit more like this? And I was like, I'm talking to the dude. <laughs> like, wow. Um, very sweet man. So yes, um, uh, I'll be doing another project with him coming up here. Yeah. Listen, do you, do you, do you have a question for Antonia? Yes. Well, first of all, you're beautiful. Where are you right now? I'm in LA. All right. Not, what, what's, I'm what's going on in LA? Well, it w looked like it was going to rain this morning, but then of course it's a beautiful sunny day. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> wait, no, wait a second. Are, wait, are you Tony Bennett's daughter? Yes. Oh my God. Can I just tell you something? That man is, I mean, is so obviously beloved around the world. I saw him on Maui. I might've been about maybe 10 years ago. He played at our premier um, performance arts sp space here called the Maui Arts and Cultural Center. I got to sit in the front row. It was the most, it was, it was literally, I'm not kidding you, the most incredible concert and it taught me so much about about how i perform these days your right. dad came out on stage i don't think there was a single song that was longer than two and a half minutes he That's was right. blowing he was blowing through songs and i was like wow he must have done 30 songs in the time that he was up there four tunes yeah he just blows through them he does like more songs and shorter solos and things like that 
and just so eloquent and then the last thing i would say about that is that um he then he said uh he told the he told him to turn off the sound system like turn off the whole sound system and he walked out to the front of the stage and he said the acoustics in this theater are amazing and and they just did like this like kind of acoustic no amplification thing wow and i mean it was jaw dropping he is truly without a doubt one of the greatest entertainers that ever lived and she tells me you know he's 95 and he still does scales right yeah and that that's the coolest thing to me Antonio. i mean like, like i gotta go back to work right <laughs> i mean you, you know you you know you're doing wow that's amazing because antonia opens for her dad yeah i was opening i might have been at that show <laughs> but oh, you were oh wait you were at that show yeah yes you were at that show, of course. <laughs> yes. I mean, it was but 10 he, years ago, so I'm just, you know. It was a while ago. And he, but, and I think we had just come, we were like on our way back from Asia. We had done an Asian tour. But, you know, and then he would do that at the end of the shows. He would do the fly me to the moon without the mic and just kill it. It, it was shocking and uh, and awe founding if that's not really a word i just made it up but it was <laughs> even for me, <laughs> even for me it was you know who watched it every night and i would tell people would ask me you know what i think about my father's voice and i'd say he's 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 an incredible singer and yeah. i'm not just that because i'm his daughter because i watch him night after night i don't know i mean there are things that he does that i could never do you know i mean wow. that makes uniquely him you know yeah that's right. And he is, and the thing too that was amazing is his pitch is right on. Oh. Right on the money, man. Some entertainers, when they get it, when they get, you know, they say, you know, they, the notes start, ah, they don't yeah, quite get yeah, there. Yeah. He was just note for note, man. It was amazing. See, that that's what I love about back in those days, even the Motown, when I used to go see Motown when I was like, you know, you know, 12, 13 years old, they didn't have monitors back then. And the Temptations and the Supremes and Four Tops and Stevie Wonder and Marvin, they were perfect pitch. That's the right. Whole, I mean, it wasn't that long ago that we were using tape and if something wasn't right, we had to slice it. Right. So you just have to get it on the first couple takes and that's it. I mean, you know, those guys all came from that school of thought. And it's it is amazing. You know, I mean most most of the old records that I listen to, none of them are perfect, but they're far more perfect than anything that we listen to that is perfect today. That's right. Because, That's right. You know, even the mistakes were beautiful. Yeah. Miles Davis goes, there are no bad notes. <laughs> <laughs> there's no such thing as bad notes right i, I love that eric come on I, I don't want to put you on the spot nothing like that but can you just sing us just a what a good your guitar can you sing us just a little bit of some hawaiian yeah. language oh yeah yeah hold on here let me grab my guitar hold on sing you some hawaiian music oh. there you go oh oh what oh look at that guitar oh Ava puhi palau ka ua noe Ahe ia no me ia I ka poli o ke aloha It's early E ku aloha e Au he alawe Ahuli aku au ia e ia oe E ku aloha e Au he ala oe Ahuli aku au ia oe Yeah man, that's a... Yes! Wow! Well done. wow. Yeah, the Hawaiian language is gorgeous. You know, lots of vowels, and it's very, it's like the palm tree swing. But that was early. Sorry about that. Now, I, now I, translate, I, I, for, <laughs> translate for us. With that. <clears throat> what does that mean? Yeah, yes. what, what's, well, translate. the song is uh, Ku'ule Avapuhi. So Avapuhi is, a, is the ginger flower. I mean, all, so, all Hawaiian songs are, you know, about love and beauty and sex. 
<laughs> They're all about sex. I mean, you know, they are. I mean, I'm not joking. In, in yeah. the Hawaiian, in the Hawaiian language, in in Hawaiian music and song, they um they typically have this thing. It's called the kauna. The kauna is the hidden meaning of the thing. So, so the song on that in that respect might be talking about you know the beautiful ginger flower and how the dew drips off the flower and the sun yeah. is shining down. You know, it's all of that. But really, there's there's a hidden meaning in there, like um. You know, a song would be singing about, you know, how the the canoe, you know, the hull of the canoe is penetrating the ocean. Yeah. You know, it's like they're really talking about sex. <laughs> now, now, wait, hold on. So now you one of Jamie Foxx's best friend, man. Tell us, <laughs> how'd you guys meet? You meet him? <laughs> well, he... I'll tell you how I met him. My sister called me. My sister's a pr real famous singer in Hawaii. My sister called me and said, don't tell mom and dad, but I'm dating a black guy. <laughs> and said, and of course, my response was like, yes. <laughs> it's like, and it was Jamie. They, they went to school together in San Diego and, uh, and they dated for a while. And then, you know, he just became, we met through that and we oh, became wow. friends and became family. And then 35, 40 years later, that was back when he was, before he was Jamie Foxx, he was yeah. his real name, which is Eric Bishop. Okay. <laughs> okay. And, uh, and he just came over to see you just recently, huh? Yeah. He was just here at Christmas time. He, 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 you know, he's like, he, he doesn't like to talk on the phone. He He's a FaceTimer. He's FaceTimer. So I'm standing in this yeah. music store. I'm standing in this music store in Kaului, and I was, like, getting some strings or something like that. And <laughs> I was saying, rrr, rrr, rrr. it's like Jamie. He's like, hey, what's up, man? I go, hey, what's up? He's like, I'm here. I'm like, well, I'm where? Because I'm here at the airport. You know, he's like this. You know, he shows me a picture, and he's got, like, all these teenagers in this beautiful jet parked at the Maui airport. He, he brought his 15-year-old daughter, um, Annalise, out for her birthday. She said, Daddy, I want to go camping in Maui. Yeah. And so he brought all these kids out. And so we took them like actual Hawaiian style camping. I have a great picture of Jamie on the beach in front of a big bonfire. And he's like dancing and doing his thing. Yeah. Yeah. We took them camping and these kids had, they'd never been, they didn't no idea. They were on the beach. It was like, it was like a movie. And yeah. Uh, so yeah, he came out here. We had a good time. Yeah. A Antonia. Now, now, I mean, you guys are so, you did you, you guys are so favorite. Did, did you ever do stuff like that? Go camping and all that kind of stuff? Our idea of camping is like a Sheraton hotel. No. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm with you, sister. I'm with you. Oh, no. I mean, even when we would go to like a Disneyland or whatever, and I just, Daddy, you want to go on the ride with rides with me? And he'd say, Nope, it's against my religion. I'm a devout Catholic. <laughs> it's against my religion. <laughs> oh. It's against, it's against mine, too, because I'll never forget, um, I got high, and, and you know, they were doing this place, there's a, you know, the, they got this one ride where it goes like this, it goes down, and it goes up like that, and then it goes back again, so you're going backwards, right? Right. And, and it was like 4th of July, so the place is packed, and even when you drive up, you know, when you finally get back, there's people just like this, you know, trying to wait to get on the ride, right? Well, it went up, okay. But when it went backwards, I threw up all over this place. Oh, yeah. You, right? Too much information, uh, okay. Yeah, too much information is kind of. She, she's cussing me out and all that in front of all these people. It's like, I ain't been back since. Well, I'll, tell, I'll tell you what, you know, I used to always, when I was a kid, I used to always, uh, you know, ask my parents to take me camping. It never, ha we had a lot of great experiences, but camping was never one of them. <laughs> but now that I have a five and a half year old and she's asking me all the time to go camping. Oh, wow. Oh, you can her, just, yeah. <laughs> my husband actually really likes to camp. Yeah. And I'm like, okay, searching the internet. Glamping. Um, Glamping? <laughs> what's that? Gosh, way. Gosh, way. have like luxury sites <laughs> yeah, um, with like, you know, where it's like a fake tent and inside there's a real bathroom, but you're in the wilderness and stuff <laughs> like that. <laughs> that's cheating, Antonia. That's cheating. That's straight up. That is cheating. You're meant to get a tent and blow up beds. <laughs> I know. 
But yeah, it's good fun. I've done cats. They, they, they officially call that glamping. Plan to go back out and start performing soon? I do. Well, I just, I have this record in the can. I, I'm almost done with it. I just have to do some final touches and mix and master it. And then I'm hoping to start getting back out there and, and touring again. I okay. really miss performing. Yeah, all of us. This whole COVID thing really just put, but there've been a lot of great things too. Like I've really gone back to kind of practicing and every day in a different kind of way. And mm -hmm. things that are hard to do on the road that you can kind of really dig into when yeah. you're at home own space so i mean there are benefits and then i've been with my family and that's been so wonderful so it's, there's good and uh it all weighs itself out i guess what, what do you do you take a big band with you i will do big band gigs you know if a big band calls me i have charts that i bring with me if they call me and say oh we'd like you to sing with our big band i'll come and sing with the big band yeah or even an orchestra you know if, the, if an orchestra calls me and says they want me to do a show, then I'll pull out my charts for that. But most of the time, if I'm touring with my own thing, I just travel with a trio or sometimes a quartet. Oh, wow. Okay. Well, Eric, I wrote this song called Music Can Save the World. And I'm going to do it like we are the world. So everybody sings two lines and then a big choir. So Antonia says she would represent California for me. Yeah. I, I'd love for you to sing a couple of lines and represent the islands. I'd be honored. Yes. Yeah? It'd be wonderful to have you guys on this song. I want people from different parts of the world, right? This is great. It, I, man, it, it, it'd be an honor to have you guys come out and sing this song. But, but I'm going to tell you what I'm doing with the money. I'm going to put this thing up to, to find shoes for people that don't have shoes in different parts of the world. And we're going to put right. shoes on these people. Because I, I always ask people, how many how many shoes you got? Oh, sure, I got about, I don't know, 16, 17 pairs of shoes. I say, how many do you wear? Uh, Two. So you bring a pair of shoes to the concert and you get $10 off the ticket. That is a great idea. Thank you, brother. Thank you. That is a great idea. I could donate. And the, uh, the other thing I'm doing is uh, I'm going around to the Rotary Clubs all around every state and, and ask the, the seniors that's, you know, they, they, their husband or their wife was a musician. And, you know, would you give us that instrument so we can give it to a single parent that has a talented kid, but they can't afford the instrument? Because I want kids to start playing instruments again, you know, to put down the computer for a minute, pick up an instrument. We understand how, how beautiful it is uh, to, to, to really be able to perform music. It's instant gratification, right? Yeah. And it's coming from the heart. Music is about emotion, you know, and, and uh, at the end of the day, how does it make you feel? It could be technically right. Yeah, but how does it feel? And that's what music does. When you do a song, you, you, like you do, you was doing that song right there. Even though I didn't know the language, it was beautiful to me. And it's, it's emotion, right? And it, and it and it swallows you up. Okay, I didn't I didn't understand his words. That's why I asked you what the words were. But but I was like, it's beautiful, right? And in every country I go to, Antonio, when you was in Italy, did you get around to places where they were singing in, in Italian over there? Oh sure, yeah. I have a lot of Italian friends that are musicians, so, you know, and, you know, the thing is, is that it really doesn't, for me anyway, it never, it doesn't matter what language somebody's singing in, if, if the music touches you, that's really the most important thing. Yeah, I'm doing this, this, it kind of, it came, again, it came out of the pandemic, it's like, you know, well, if the people don't want to come to you, go to the people, so I go to, I'm, right. going, I'm going to these, these uh, very large condominium complexes of, you know, and they're beautiful, they're like gorgeous, right on the ocean, it's like this thing, and my, my cousin manages one of them, she's like, hey, would you ever want to come down, I was like, I got nothing to do, I'll come down and play. And so I set up my little PA system, went down there and played. And now it's like two to 300 people on Wednesday. And these people are, it's like, it's like a drug. They're just like, they're so, and, and I sing a lot of songs in the Hawaiian language. They have no idea what I'm saying, but it doesn't even matter. <laughs> as long as it's good, nobody cares. That's right. Yeah. They love it. And, and so now they look forward to every Wednesday, right? Yeah, man. <laughs> I, I look forward to it too. It's like a beautiful captive to, audience of two to 300 people. They're all sitting out on this beautiful manicured lawn and the sun is setting behind me. It's yeah. like a movie. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's just gorgeous, man. It's just, yeah. So it's, it's one of the wonderful things that came out of the pandemic. 
Yeah. Eric, I'd like to ask you actually, have you ever written any social conscious songs yourself? And what does social conscious music mean to you? Have I written any? Yes. Yeah. I wrote a song called Voice of Change. I mean, you know, social social consciousness is just collective mindset of, you know, of creating a better world for, for everybody. I still think one of the greatest songs written of all time is John Lennon's Imagine. It's just, it's, you know, um, I mean, I... I grew up in a very uh, mm, sort of quasi-religious home. I'm, I grew up in a in, in like I, perhaps the most boring denomination of our religion, which is Lutherans. Yeah, they're just they're just people that are just glad. They're just happy to see you, and they're just glad people. I'm just glad about everything, which is cool. You know, it's all good. <laughs> But, but I just, I grew up in this environment. I was kind of cool, you know, but I was that one kid who was, you know, sitting in the front row in church and he'd, you know, they'd, he'd say something and I'd be like, well, I'd raise my hand. Yeah. <laughs> and I'd be like, well, yeah, I don't understand that. What do you, wait, you, he, what, he, he had an actual boat and then he put all the animals on a boat. Like, you know, <laughs> and I, I, and so that parlayed, you know, 30, 40 years later to me just kind of going, man, I think. You know that's been one of the that's been one of the atrocities of our species has been the you know proliferation of bad religious ideas mm -hmm. and ideals and that's really you know the, the, some some of the things that are really separating us as 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 a at the end of the day we are just a species we're another species on planet earth and that's right i think we need to get we need to we need to get over all that stuff we need to get past all those those ideas it's like cool believe whatever you want to believe that's all good but like you know um I, I think the tr a lot of the trouble we're in right now is it, it stems from these really bad ideas and bad ideals. And so, you know, and, and, and out on the periphery of that is, you know, um, the, the real issues we're having on this planet. And, and you know, I, I love George Carlin, who's one of my favorite all-time comedians, who just, he always just said, you know, uh, the planet's going to be fine. We're fucked. <laughs> <laughs> because it's true. The, he remember he used to say the planet will shake us off like a case of bad fleas. Yeah, yeah. it's like it's you know. So it's really so to answer your question, it's like what it means to me is that we we got to focus on us as a species. Like what are we doing as human beings with that's one right. another? That's the, the, right. the, yeah, the planet. We got to deal with that stuff. We got to yes, there's stuff that's happening, but it's really you know it's like they say evolution doesn't care about us. It just doesn't. Yeah. The, the planet, well, it's going to do what it's going to do. We may be here. We may yeah. not be here. It's going to keep going. It's been going for billions of years. So we got to focus on uh, us as a species. You know what's beautiful? is Antonia said the same thing about Imagine. Oh. That's how that song affected all of us. And it's like Imagine Peace. That's what he said. About peace, right? is that peace is the answer. You know, I, I'd always say, you know, uh, Paul was the cute one in, in the Beatles, right? But but it was John that was writing the most significant parts of songs, right? And when he when no nobody nobody was really paying a lot of attention to John until he wrote Imagine, and it separated him from everything from all the Beatles stuff, right? And it, it happens to a lot of musicians when they write social social conscious music because you, you now you give you tell the story. And when I go out and speak to young people, you know, I said. You know, I know social conscious music just goes over your head. It's, it's, it doesn't sound exciting or nothing like that, right? But if there was something in the world that you could change, what would that be? And they would always have an idea about that. And I say, go write that song. And that gave them, oh, okay, let me put a melody to my feelings, you know? And, and that that's helped me when I go out and do speaking engagement to these kids because you know, it might be 300 of them in the room, but 25 or 30 of them might call me, hey, Skyler. And it's something just about the way to go, hey, Skyler. I already, already know they wrote a social conscious song. And the, the best part about it is when they go, and my friends liked it too. You know, I, I think I could do this. And so I started a lot of young people on, on this trail, man, of, of writing social conscious music. And with this platform, if I get enough songs, like, you know, uh, Antonia says she's she's going to write one, and if you could send us one, do you remember my you remember my wedding label, right? Remember my, I, my, yeah, 
I used to have a yeah, and 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 uh, you know, you wrote this song for my wedding label, but it, but it's it's it was tailored. You know what I mean? I watched this guy. He did did this wedding event, and I said, man, well, I do all original wedding songs. Because brides want something different, just like they want their they dress to be different. They want the day to be different. But they don't have any new, mus new music. They use the same songs all over again. So I started you know writing all it. Huh? The, the number one uh, wedding song that uh, uh, is picked for the, the dance, the uh, bride and groom dance, yeah. is Bill, With Bill Withers' A Lovely Day. Yes, it is. Oh, wow. That's great. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I wrote a song called Let's Get Married. Saturday is the perfect day for a wedding day. Let's get married. Right? Uh. And, so, and so so uh, then I wrote all these tunes, but I had all my friends. I called Eric. I said, Eric, you got a song? He sent a song. I put it on the compilation, right? Well, but this this one guy was making money. You know, like he he uh, he had 8,000 brides, right? They all played 10. So it's, they paid $10 to get in. And then he, he said, I'll give you a booth. So the booth was you know, tuxedo, uh, dresses, uh, DJ, uh, rings, uh, you know, and I, every, and it just started over again, right? And he, and he was making like, you know, a couple thousand dollars per, you know, per booth on top of the 8,000 brides that came out. And he says he does that like four times a year and he don't work for the rest of the year. That's, he don't play no music. But there's always you. You, they, you can brides love new songs, and that's what I found out that was cool. You know, even though I didn't have a major distributing company, so I could put the songs out. You know, I could only sell it at you know. But it, it's a four point two billion dollar business in California alone, with all the diamond rings and the, weddings are a racket. It's a racket. It's right. It's a racket. Yeah, it is. It's there's, quite a thing. Yeah, there's ten. There's ten thousand. Ten thousand weddings a year on Maui. I'm sure. Ten thousand. I'm sure, man. It's the most romantic place you ever want to be with that with that sunset behind you. And uh, come on, man. The another my first time coming here, I stayed at the Grand White Lake, and you know the Grand Light, It's a five star hotel, and that's how I met you because the concierge said, "Hey, man, I got." There's two guys down the street, man. They played at this restaurant. And you guys were cleaning up, man, at that restaurant. I'm like, you know, there's just two, just both of you guys with the guitars singing. You know what I mean? Like that. And it was so beautiful. I, I want to retire on Maui. That's that's because it's just so romantic. And I want to put my feet up, eat papayas and, and, and pineapples and, you know, and look <laughs> over the ocean. You know, I've, I've got five years to go and I'm, I'm coming over, man. I ain't been there 20 years now. And I, I lived there for that 10 years, you know, when I lived Ed, in, I didn't know that. I lived on, on, in Lahaina for 10 years at, at Puamana. And uh, I, I, when I met all you guys, man, I just fell in love with all you guys. And, and you know, I, I want to come back. Now my, now my buddy Eric Daniels lives there. Uh, he plays on The Voice. And then, you know, all kind of great, talented people. So I, I'll be safe. I can, I can still go and perform and stuff like that, you know. Yeah, man, there's 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 plenty to do out here, without a doubt. You know, it's a tourist destination. I mean, I played at the Four Seasons last night, and, and it was like, you know, for Valentine's Day, and there was hundreds of people just having the best time of their life, and yeah. it was gorgeous. It was beautiful, and I mean, I played, I played, I played every love song I could think of, man, <laughs> including my funny Valentine. Yeah, yeah, there you go. There you go. <laughs> well, hey, wait, I wanted to make, uh, Antonia, I wanted to um, also mention that the Lady Gaga special was un. I, I, I it was, I, I'm a fan of hers, but I'm a huge fan of hers now. The way, she, the way right. that that whole thing went down, you're, I mean, it was just so eloquent and it was amazing how she was just like a tornado around him and he just stood there just like next yeah. to that piano he didn't have to yeah. move he was yeah. just like it was just such so beautifully done were you there for that i was there for that oh, yeah so awesome. you know i mean she really loves him and respects him we all just want to see him 
shine with grace as he always has. And, you know, he's allowed me to stand in his light for so long and so many others. Like, he's always been very generous in that way. And I think she really wanted to honor him and successfully did that. I, I, it was a beautiful show. Tom, do you have any uh, more questions? I do. Well, Eric, I've got a question for you. Um, You've got a one-man show, is that right? Yes. Is that something you're working on or that you've already you've completed now? Yeah, it was no. another thing. It happened. Um, so I, I have this crazy, we all have, we all have a rich history of family and people in our lives. And my, my story, um, I, I wanted to tell my story uh, about growing up as a white Hawaiian, which is really what I am. And uh, my dad, my great grandmother on my dad's side was pure Hawaiian, and my mom's from Wisconsin. So, so I have a lot of Hawaiian blood in me, and and I grew up here, and I always I was the little white kid, you know, amongst all these brown kids, and um, and so, but you know, growing up in Hawaii, Hawaii is such a melting pot. Like race was that was never really an issue here. It's like. Cause there was always a melting pot of all these different ethnicities so but i have this rich story uh that i wanted to tell so i got together with a, an amazing writer friend of mine and we wrote a one-man show inspired great mostly by john leguizamo great actor from new york who yeah. had written a series of broadway one-man broadway shows that were were great and so I we wrote the story and we launched the show in uh, dis, in uh, December of 2019, before the world came to an end. Had a hugely successful run, um, yeah. And so I tell the story about um, it starts at the turn of the century and it starts with my great grandfather who was a barefisted boxer from San Francisco who got shanghaied on a boat and ended up in. Maui in the in the boat harbor and my great grandmother had just paddled a canoe from Molokai and they met in Kalui Harbor and the story starts there and I play all of the characters I play great grandma great grandpa I play my grandmother my mom my dad my brother my sister and I come out in full costume change full everything it's yeah. got this it's got music in it and it's just sort of one man 75 minute insane ride where I just take you through um, a lot of visuals too. Um, yeah. I show you, you get to see a sort of a visual um, history of of Hawaii told through the lens of of a of a young little white Hawaiian boy who you know eventually ended up in New York on Broadway. So yeah, it's this it's wow. this crazy wonderful little piece that um, is is really precious to me. It's really kind of my baby. It's it's the I was planning to take it on tour and then the world came to an end. I have visions of this being in like a 99 seat theater in New York City, which it's it, it's a proper show it's a proper yeah. broadway show and and it's 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 i mean they gave me they gave me the title tour de force because the costume changes are big and they're they're extreme you know my grandmother my great grandmother had like huge boobs and a big ass and she was this big hawaiian <laughs> woman with a big wig and she comes out and she was scrappy and she had a big you know like and my great grandfather was this barefisted boxer dude with like bozo hair yeah. and so the images of of everybody that's uh that's in the show and it's it's also the show is really a tribute to my dad my dad was a wonderful 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 human being and it's one of the reasons why i i see a lot of my dad in your dad um antonia i just just uh that's because uh, my dad passed 12 years ago and when i was watching you you know your dad and i was watching that show it just it just your dad my dad had the same kind of vibe just this gentle sweet kind wonderful persona and um the show is really a tribute to him uh and i have a lot of dialogue with him in the show and uh and so yeah so but thank you for asking and yes the show is coming back in may yeah hoping to get back on tour with him you know i hate to bring this show to a close but but you know, I, I really love you guys. And thank you so much for taking the time to come on the show. Yeah. Skyler, for, for having me and um, great to meet everybody. And I hope we get to chat again soon. Eric, thank you so much, brother. I love you, man. I love you too. Facing up.
you, man. 